Hello, I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, even when times are tough, many of us are finding ways to share. Share good laughs and good food and good music. Let's see how. This is our Vancouver. Coming up, a local pastry chef is realizing his life's dream of opening his unique cafe in Chinatown where he grew up. And how a bipolar, introverted musician is thriving and sharing joy during the pandemic. But first, diversifying the world of comedy. Now, in these serious times with COVID-19 and conversations about racial justice, a local school is making it a little easier to spread some laughter. Blind Tiger Comedy is offering free online classes in improv and in sketch comedy for people who identify as black, indigenous, or a person of color, or BIPOC, and they're new to the school. Now, Tom Hill is a co-director of Blind Tiger Comedy. Tom, hello there. Hi, Gloria. Now, we had originally booked Ronald Dario, one of your diversity program coordinators for this. We weren't able to catch up with him, so thank you so much for stepping in today. My pleasure, Gloria. Thanks for having me. So why would you say it's important to, to offer these free comedy classes to BIPOC people? Uh, well, I guess um, it's, a, it's sort of related to why I'm stepping in. I think, uh, you know, just for starters, the fact that I uh, am a white, cis, hetero man running a comedy school um, with uh, the co-director um, of the comedy school. And so many comedy spaces are run or... Uh, directly benefit uh, white folks and especially white men, um, especially white straight men. So uh, the reason we do initiatives like this is to welcome more and more voices into comedy. And we think that's a really urgent uh, question. So, um, yeah, as a starting point to welcome more voices, more perspectives, more experiences into this wonderful thing that is comedy. Well, it's just interesting, I think, as well, the, the whole concept of a comedy school. I mean, some people say you're, you're funny or you're not funny. So what specifically can people expect to learn from your classes? Uh, Gloria, I think a lot of it is bringing out what people find funny themselves. Um, and we really try and teach that, that it's not about trying to do comedy the particular way that I do it or that uh, other teachers uh, do it or other comedians. But rather, we're trying to go like, OK, what really makes you laugh? And what are some skills that... Uh, encourage you or enable you to bring out that comedy on stage and share that with audiences. So, yeah, I think it's like less about, I'm not really of the belief, no, some people are funny, some people aren't. It's more like, let's get the funniest you out on stage. Or sometimes we say, come find your funny. <laughs> come find your funny, okay. Well, it can be tough these days. I mean, a lot of people are more sensitive these days when it comes to talking about issues of race or representation. So I guess in that context, how do you encourage, you know, creativity and, and respect and comedy? Have a little fun in the class, too. Yeah, uh, a big one for that is just creating a safe environment. Um, we're trying to do everything we can to cre create the safest environment we can. And, and so we have a few things that way. We have a pretty extensive anti-harassment policy that every student has to sign before they come to class. And before every class, uh, we talk through that anti-harassment policy. It's the first thing we do. Um, and then from there, if something comes up in class, you know, uh, it is our expectation. Of course, I can't personally guarantee that at every time, but certainly uh, most of the time our teachers will address stuff as it comes up. And just really foregrounding that that kind of conversation is okay if something comes up in an improv scene, which it might, um, we can all expect that we'll have a reasonable conversation about that, talk about what happened, maybe decompress a little bit how we're feeling about it. Um, and again, it's not like it happens all that much, but having that space be okay for those conversations is a, is a great starting point for people to feel more confident uh, having the conversations we need to have as we do comedy. Okay, so what kinds of conversations are, are coming up then? I mean, can you give us an example of how comedians can, can learn to be better by, by you know, talking about these issues of race and, and representation? Can I give you an example? Well, I think in terms of how comedians can get better, um, that's just doing the learning, you know? Uh, us all as individual humans learning more about um, our privilege and the ways that our 
in, in my case, the various ways my privileges have enabled me to have the experiences that I have. Uh, so that that's maybe not an improv class uh, question, but I think uh, in terms of how we handle it in a class, if something were to come up in a scene, um, it's on me as the teacher to go, okay, so this happened, this is what I saw, um, what else did everyone else experience, um, why or why not is this an issue, and what can we expect to do better differently or do better next time. Um, those are usually very productive conversations and lead to, you know, maybe it can feel a bit tense at the time because we're all getting better at having those conversations. Uh, but certainly we've seen so much as we've made this more and more a priority in our school, we've seen more and more joy and a range of voices feeling comfortable to continue taking classes, which is to everyone's benefit. Yeah, I should say, so to everyone's benefit, just taking it along that theme then, how would you say having more diverse comedians in our mix uh, can make the local scene better? Oof. Um, well, I'd love to find out all the ways it could. Uh, in, in some ways, uh, the ways that, you know, because there's, we still do have such a, in Canada and North America, a very, a very white comedy scene in general. But what do, we, what do we get to enjoy? What are we lucky to have when we have um, different voices in comedy? Like, uh, lots of good things for comedy. We get more variety, which is good for comedy. We get a range of different voices, which is good for comedy. We stop telling the same kinds of stories over and over again. Um, the ones that we're used to in our white homes, you know, uh, and the very classic sort of tired improv scenes that we've seen doing, you know, whatever it might be. Um, Christmas morning scenes, for example, you know, no knock on Christmas, but we've seen a thousand cr Christmas morning scenes. What other kinds of scenes are there? And, that's not for me to say, but I think we we will stand to benefit greatly as comedy audiences to find out what kinds of new scenes we'll get to enjoy if we make it safe for those voices to share them with us. Well, since your comedy school has put out this call then or this offer for, for free classes for BIPOC folk, uh, what's the reaction been like? It's been cool. Um, we've had a number of folks, I think we've got um, well over 30 now that are that are signed up and we just announced a bunch more classes uh, actually featuring teachers from all over the world um, and those classes also have space for um, BIPOC folks coming coming to us uh, yeah but I mean generally it's been it's been awesome but I think when we really see the the benefit or the the great response is uh, you know down the road and we've seen that a little bit with last year we had a welcome last summer for uh, folks who identify as women trans and or femme and our schools benefited so much from that. We've got a terrific increase in those voices in our school. And the result is, again, like a more fun place to do comedy, a healthier place to do comedy. It's great. Tom, thanks for giving us something to smile about today. Nice to talk to you. Oh, very nice to talk to you, Gloria. Take care. Hi, I'm Brandon. Got back from Robson. We are watching our Vancouver. Right, it's time for one of our favorite features of the program. This is when we get to showcase some of the photographs that you have sent us. Let's start with this one by Shelley Biscaro. She sent us this photograph of a hummingbird at her garden feeder who braved the very rainy day. Very sharp, lovely. And the low sun casts a gorgeous orange on the water at Qualicum Beach in this photo. Thanks so much to Susan Wakefield for sending this in. And finally, Jisan captured this lovely image of Canadian geese at Alouette Lake one Sunday evening. Just wonderful. Thank you. And do send us more. It's easy. Just email them to us, bcphotos at cbc.ca. All one word, bcphotos at cbc.ca. Coming up, how a homeless man became the caretaker and security guard for a church in Surrey. Welcome back to our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, there's a man who has been living in an empty shed outside of Surrey Church for the last three months. And when church leaders found out they had a squatter, they thought they'd have to kick him out. But then, as Jesse Johnston reports, they got to know Gordon Petrie, and everything changed. When Sunday services were closed during the pandemic, Staff at Holy Cross Ukrainian Catholic Church spotted something strange on their surveillance cameras. 
Every day, a stranger would come onto their property and clean it up. At first, we were, you know, concerned. You know, we had a homeless man living in our shed. But once we had a few conversations with him, got to know him, I realized that he's really uh, a really good guy. That really good guy can't do nothing without tools is Gordon Petrie. A 50-year-old bricklayer by trade who fell on hard times three years ago, ran into trouble with the law, and wound up on the street. In mid-March, he moved into the empty shed on church property. This uh, church has become a bit of a safe haven for me now, and the people that go here are awesome. It's my home. That shed is my house. It's everything I own. Petrie earns his keep as a groundskeeper, security guard, and handyman. So, Hitchin lets him stay. You know, we had lots of problems with theft, and we would find needles on the property. And once Gordon moved in, all of that went away. After a while, Petrie and Hitchin struck up a friendship. So, Hitchin went to church leadership and asked them to fix up an old house on the property that's sat empty since the parish priest moved out years ago. We could have Gordon uh, look after our property and in exchange have him live in, in the, the house. But there's a problem. There's mold in the home. The bishop determined it's unsafe to live in, so the best thing to do for now is board it up and find another way to help Petrie. He's worried that I'm gonna get sick being in the house because of the mold. Um, I just wish he could see where I am now. <laughs> It's a lot worse. Now it's cold. When Hitchin so first met Petrie, he was a squatter. The weather, then he became a caretaker, and now he's a friend with nowhere to go. The hope is there's someone out there with a big heart and a spare room who can help him out. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, sir. It's a new Chinatown cafe whose unique menu has been a lifetime in the making. It's called Queen Cafe, and it's expected to open this month. So to tell us all about it, we have uh, reached its owner and executive chef, Andrew Han. Andrew, hello there. Hi, Gloria. So nice to meet you. So let's start with the name. It's pronounced Queen, but it's actually spelled K-O-U-I-G-N. So what does that mean? That's right. Very good on the spelling there. Um, <laughs> so the Queen Amon is basically a European pastry. It's a laminated dough, just like a croissant, but it's baked. Um, it's a little more dense and it has a caramelized sugary crust. Um, and it is one of my favorite pastries. And so I took the name from that. Love it. Love it. Now, people do know you as a pastry chef around town. You've been uh, an assistant at Beta 5 Chocolates as well. So tell us about Queen. What can people expect at your cafe? Well, the Queen Cafe is basically just kind of like this vision that I've had in my mind for so long. Um, Alice in Wonderland was one of my favorite books, and so I'm trying to create this magical space and a magical menu um, if, as if the Mad Hatter's Tea Party was based in Chinatown. So we're looking at having fun items like the White Rabbit Cookie that I did last year for the pop-up in Chinatown. Um, we're going to be doing some sandwiches and Vietnamese coffee and iced teas as well. Lovely. Okay, White Rabbit Cookie. Tell us all about that. Yeah, so the White Rabbit Cookie was inspired by a memory um, I had in childhood. Uh, going grocery shopping with my mom every day. If I was cranky or it was a long grocery haul in Chinatown, she would buy me White Rabbit candies to kind of make me happy. Um, and so it's a creamy, milky white uh, ch uh, candy that came from, from somewhere in China, I believe. And um, it's just one of my favorite treats that I've ever had as a kid. So I decided to create a cookie using a blend of wheat flour and mochiko flour um, and baking um, the white rabbit candy into it, studded with some chocolate chips. Oh, Valentine. lovely. Oh, my mouth is yeah. watering just as, <laughs> as you're speaking, honestly, because I know exactly what you mean by the white rabbit candy. It kind of yes. melts in your mouth, but it has just a, a really soft sweetness, a real, yes. a real softness to it. Yeah, I like that. Okay, can't wait to try one of those. So interesting, Andrew, you were born and raised in, in the Chinatown area. So what's it like you know, opening up your own cafe there? That's crazy. Um, I mean, for so many years, I've dreamed of coming back to the neighborhood and kind of Chinatown has just changed so much since I left uh, when, I was, when I was a teenager. And um, it's meant a lot to me. I've, I've been looking for a location here in Chinatown for the last two years or so. Um, and I really just wanted to kind of come back and be a part of it and bring back some of my 
the memories that I had growing up as a kid and kind of modernize the Chinatown bakery. Okay, let's talk about that then. Because you did grow up in the neighborhood, how do you hope to, you know, kind of pay homage to, to what you love about that area and what you remember as a kid and still incorporate what you've learned from sort of, you know, classic Western cuisine? What's that going to look like and taste like? Yeah, so all of my training is basically, you know, classic European training. And um, I wanted to combine that with the flavors of my childhood, the flavors that my mother um, exposed me to um, as a child, and the, the ingredients that we really, you know, bought from Chinatown. Um, so I wanted to take those inspirations of the Chinatown baked goods and combine them with my mother's flavors and, um, you know, and wrap all that up uh, in my uh, culinary and, and pastry training. You know, I, I, I admire your, your perseverance. These are tough times, and I know that you plan to open the cafe earlier. So yes. how has COVID-19 affected your plans? Well, I am going into business for the first time ever. Um, so it, you know, it, it was before COVID even happened, it was already challenging as it was. And when COVID hit, I actually, um, I guess I was just hearing so many things about the industry and what's, what was going to happen with the industry. People were shutting their doors. And I got really terrified. I really didn't know what to do. So for about three weeks when COVID ha happened and we were all asked to stay home, um, I was actually trying to get out of this lease. <laughs> I was actually trying to back out of it because I just didn't know how to move forward with it. Um, but it took you know, everyone in the community, um, people that I've worked with in the industry, my family, my friends, um, to convince me that I have something special um, to share and that it is, and it has been my dream for such a long time, and I just can't give up on it. And at this time, I really just think that COVID is a great opportunity for new business owners to kind of create some excitement and bring some hope and happiness and, and spread joy and love to in people's lives. And that's kind of what the hospitality industry is about, right? So um, I'm just, I've just decided to go for it. Well, it's interesting you talk about spreading a little bit of, you know, optimism in the neighborhood as well, because, yeah. it, I mean, Chinatown's been hard hit, right? It's had its ups and downs over the years as well. So what role would you like to see your cafe in sort of revitalizing the community? Yeah, I mean, like, there's so many new businesses in Chinatown. It's, it's, it's been great to see it kind of grow and evolve, but it has been hit. Um, you're right about that. And um, I just want to kind of bring some excitement back into Chinatown, bring back some of the authenticity of, you know, the food and the flavors from, that a lot of people grew up with. And um, I just want to bring people into the neighborhood, um, you know, and hopefully that, uh, you know, exciting and new things can happen. Okay. We're anticipating now, Andrew, just when, when can we try your, your <laughs> white rabbit cookies and, and beyond? When are you opening? Oh, my goodness. That is the question. Um, uh, everybody's been asking on my social media. I've been getting phone calls, emails. I am working as hard as I possibly can to get this place open. And um, I feel like, the, like there's the, the, I can see the finish line. And I, I'm hoping that we can open within two weeks. Fingers crossed. Fingers All the best crossed. to you. Thank you so, Thank you so, so much. much. This is Sina from Blends. You're watching our Vancouver. A lot of big events have been canceled or have gone online since the pandemic hit. Here are a couple of safe, enjoyable options for you. Wicked is the theme of this year's Queer Arts Festival, which features 11 days of streaming art tours, presentations, and performances. All events are free or by donation, and it starts on July 16th. The coronavirus can't stop the Indian Summer Festival from throwing a closing party on July 18th. The online concert is free or by donation. But if you want the multi-course menu delivered to your door, well, you're going to have to pay for that. Their website is indiansummerfest.ca. Hey, I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music coming to you from home with an awesome new song for your summer staycation playlist from a wicked Toronto wordsmith named Abdominal. But before I share his new tune with you, let's crunch some Abdominal music history. Well, they say that you're never get a second chance to make that first impression. If that's the case, man, come on, just give me your unadulterated attention. Just a suggestion, especially for the people who never heard me before. If you're not 100% satisfied, get your money back from the store. Because we're just that confident with this product, and it's so flipping hot that it's off the thermometer. It's the phenomenon of people be hopping on, so follow along on the app. Domino workout, working out with the first that I shout into my microphone. More than words from my mouth, more like the end result of years of me just chilling in my river room. Not giving a 
Yes, the man with a steadier flow than the Humber River. That is Toronto rapper Abdominal going back early in his career to his record Escape the Pigeonhole from 2007 for that tune, Abdominal Workout. He loves singing about his passions from cycling the streets of Toronto and his award-winning song Pedal Pusher to his love and knowledge for chicken wings. Chicken wings, chicken wings One of my favorite things to eat Fried and then tossed in a bowl of hot sauce With some butter plus vinegar and a little dash of cayenne Tastes so delicious, they clearly were meant for flying Whoa, chicken wings Well, Teresa retreated back to the kitchen To see what she could do with the depleted and reduced Stock, because soup stock or trash the two ah chins for wings back in the day no that wasn't an ad for the down low chicken shack that was abdominal and the obliques with a brief history of the chicken wing a song from the album Sitting Music that was released in 2012. In 2020, Abdominal continues to write songs and make music about his favorite things, including his recent Zen pastime, urban fishing. Check it out. What I mean, if I'm being honest, all I really want is to go fishing, to go fishing, to go fishing, man, I want to go fishing. I want to go fishing. Yeah, that's what I'm wishing. All I really want is to go fishing. But why fishing? Hey, I'm glad you asked. Simple answer, man, it's a blast. But more to it than that, let me expand. When I'm standing out there, feet upon the land, mud on my boots, dog by my side, in some remote forest with bugs buzzing by. Well, that's where I find the meaning that I seek. Social media recedes and I can start breathing deep. Getting in touch with the land, the air, the water, and himself. That was Toronto rapper Abdominal who has gone fishing. That was the latest single from the musician who has never followed the trends. He's only followed his passions and he has the art to show for it. And apparently the fish, although Abs informs me that it's all catch and release within the city limits of Toronto. Gone Fishing by Abdominal is the song that you need to reel in and grill up for your summer staycation playlist for this week. I'm Grant Lawrence. Stay safe, keep Canadian music alive, and I'll check in with you again soon. Coming up, two Vancouver actors talk about their roles in the new Netflix series based on books from the 80s, The Babysitter's Club. Hi, welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, a large snake was recently found in an unlikely location, a park in Coquitlam. The meter-long boa constrictor was eventually captured by animal control and taken to a local vet. But as Deborah Goble reports, it happens a lot more than you might think. Oh, she wants a video. A boa constrictor in a Coquitlam park on a Saturday. Not what you might expect to come across but you'd be surprised how often they show up. The snake was about 10 centimeter in diameter, so about this big and at least two meters. A few weeks ago, David Degan was walking through the same Coquitlam Park and came across a bin filled with snakes. I would have expected more bears or other bigger mammals, but yes, a tropical like python uh, is kind of strange or out of place here. Dr. Adrian Walton owns the Dudney Animal Hospital. He is one of the few vets in BC licensed to treat reptiles. Over the years, he's been brought many abandoned snakes. These guys uh, got dumped, we think, though there's a very, very small chance that somebody lost their pet while taking it for a walk in the park. We somehow doubt that. Owning a snake is legal, but he says it's not for everyone. For the right person, 
reptiles and exotic animals can be absolutely wonderful pets. The problem it is, so many people get these animals for the wrong reasons, that they don't do their research. Degen found three snakes. They were only a few meters from a playground. One died, two survived. The snakes were right there, but when I took a picture of it and I went home, I realized that there was right one right by my foot. Since they're not natural to BC, these snakes were likely once pets and they are rarely dangerous. Your cat would more likely eat it than it eat your cat. Dr. Walton says every summer he expects at least four or five abandoned snakes to make their way into his animal hospital. Since it's not even July, he figures the numbers may be even higher this year. Deborah Goble, CBC News, Vancouver. You're watching our Vancouver. Now, when synth-pop musician Chersey wrapped up her Canadian tour last August in her hometown of Vancouver, she was expected to be back on the road again in March and April. Of course, COVID-19 stopped those plans in their tracks. But she has actually taken the downtime to make new music at home and connect with Stephen Quinn on the early edition. Tell me what the past few months have been like for you as an artist and performer, because everything has ground to a halt. Yeah, well, for me, I, I'm in the fortunate position where I'm kind of, uh, I'm working towards my next album. So oh, I, use, I use this break actually to finish my album. So um, I wrote about four songs, um, demoed like front to back, full production. Um, and I did four of them and now the album's finished. So I've kind of utilized the break in a different way. I have like a lot of friends who have been doing live shows and lots of streaming. Um, I've been using it for kind of more administrative stuff and uh, right. some writing creative. Yeah. And, and, and how has this, this pandemic been for creativity? Is it good or is it bad for you? It's been really, really good for me. I mean, like, I, I'm, I have bipolar, so <laughs> any, like, I, I just constantly have things to talk about, I feel. Um, but we did write, and I worked, worked actually with a student on a co-write, um, and we wrote a song called Lone Waiting for Love. Um, and, um, and that's probably going to be on the next album. But that one was strictly about... Um, about COVID and basically being isolated and having nobody with you. Cause that's kind of mm -hmm. what my break has been. I'm, I'm, I, I seem like an extrovert, but I'm an introvert. And so I've been here alone for the most, most part of it. Yeah. And how's that felt for you? Um, well, going back to the whole bipolar thing, it's been difficult. I've been finding that I've been like going through like these phase, these phase phases and these cyclical kind of few rotations of like the mania and the depression. And I feel like, it's so funny because we're in isolation and it's, there's nothing else to focus on. So it's easy to look at my, you know, my mental health swings and be like, Oh, something's happening or oh, something's happening and be a little bit more scared or concerned about it. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I've been able to thrive. Fortunately. Yeah. We've all, we've all spent a lot more time with ourselves these days, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's a great thing to do. You know, I think it's, we don't spend enough time with ourselves these days. You have got a song to perform for us this morning. Um, what are you going to play for us? Yes, sir. Um, I'm going to play. I'm going to play the wolf. You guys, um, I've been very, very fortunate and very blessed. Thank you, guys, for spinning this song for as as long as you have. Um, but I've never really played it live for you guys, which is weird. It's been like four years. Um, so I'm finally going to play the wolf. And uh, the reason why I'm playing the wolf is um, is because the wolf is just about exploiting that darkness and trying to find the light. Um, and I think right now, that's what I'm trying to do. And that's what I'm trying to do as an ally and as a friend mm. and, um, and as a musician and using my platform in that way. So I feel like um, this song is very representative of that. Um, and it also talks a lot about uh, mental health and um, let the burden go on like the fool whose only goal is spurning you. And that's literally talking about yourself. Hmm. So it's just like letting that all go um, because there's so much, so much wrong in the world right now that you just need to give yourself the grace um, to be able to process these things um, just after everything that's happened. So I, I, I hope that this brings a little bit of comfort and peace to you. <laughs> all right. Take it away.
whether it's the 80s, the 90s, or now, there's something about the Babysitter's Club that speaks to many young girls. And local actors Malia Baker and Mamona Tamada play two of the babysitters in the new Netflix series based on the novels. They talk about the show and what it was like to shoot in their hometown in this video produced for CBC Kids News. The stories from the books before are completely timeless. The themes are timeless and they were also relatable and especially to younger girls. You can see yourself in at least one of these five girls. It all started at the very beginning of seventh grade. Hi, we're the Babysitter's Club. Call us if you need us. Bye! So many people, I think, will love the show because they grew up with the books and now kind of like, maybe if they have kids, they can watch the reboot with their kids. And like, if not, I think it's just a super family-friendly show and 
tackles issues that like kids go through and also even parents as well. With the parents that grew up with this book, they'll have a sense of nostalgia and they're gonna hand it down to their younger kids or younger nieces or cousins or sisters. Are you sure this thing actually works? The Etsy shop I bought it from said it's fully operational. Yeah, but it's 25 years old. It's iconic. <gasps> oh my God. <laughs> Good afternoon, Babysitter's Club. Every weekend we would hang out with each other and I think, yeah, it was so fun to show the other girls around, like, you're home. They all were very surprised with Timbits. They call it donut holes. And I was like, hold up. No, 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 it's Timbits. You are learning about yourselves and the way you want to be in the world. Oh, no! I know it's hard, but we're here. You are such a strong woman, Christy. Um, the show tackles a lot of issues that, with the contemporary spin, uh, is even more relatable than the books were. And the books are already super relatable. I think kids have such like a big voice that people don't like, that are kind of underestimated. And these girls being so like independent and powerful, like feminists is like a huge inspiration for hopefully younger generations and kids like watching the show. Chocolate chips. Chips. Chocolate chips. <laughs>really good question. Um, I think I would have Marianne's organization skills, and I can be organized at times, but I think I could use that extra push of how organized Marianne always is. I would say maybe Stacy's fashion sense. I'm pretty organized. Making schedules for myself, like especially for school, like I need to pace myself, which is definitely like the inner Marianne in me. I started the Babysitter's Club to take care of kids, but what I realized, we were more than a club, we were best friends. Babysitter's Club! <laughs> Coming up, how BC cherry growers are confronting the challenges posed by COVID-19 and how they're working to keep their workers safe. are watching our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now some of BC's produce growers are struggling to find enough people to pick the fruits of their labor. The pandemic is a big factor in the problem. And as Tina Lovegreen learned, farmers are having to get creative to find workarounds. In BC's Okanagan, the skies have cleared up just in time to get some work done. After a rain, it's so hard. It's like you're trying to go fast, but you don't want to fall. But the harvest season is off to a rough start. Every time it rains and the sun comes out, the cherries split. You know, that's all it takes. That's how fragile the fruit is. And on top of that, they're struggling to find the thousands of people they need to pick the fruit before it spoils. Usually at this point, I would have had 80, 90 people phone asking, uh, you know, when's cherry picking starting? I've had, I think, four people call. And I think some of it's just the travel across the country. Some is people are scared. Everyone's just scared right now. Scared because of COVID-19 or unable to get here because of border closures, meaning fewer workers from places like Mexico. Traditionally, 1,500 young people from Quebec make the journey to BC, but not this year. Wow. Every day there's people showing up and asking for workers, which is not something that happens every year. And like I get offered three different jobs every day. It's a really bad season with the COVID and everything, so it's really hard for everybody, like the farmers and us. There are new safety protocols inside processing plants, and when workers are in the field, it's easy to stay apart. The worry comes when they're done for the day. 
For many workers, finding clean and safe accommodation can be a challenge at the best of times, but it's even more of a concern now with COVID-19. Several communities are considering campgrounds to keep people safe, like this one, where physical distancing and other measures can be enforced. There have been worries about people driving from Quebec where COVID rates are much higher. We welcome them, but we want them to be respectful of the communities that they're working in and our citizens, and I have found that they are. After all, these workers are deemed an essential service, and they need them to come back next year. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Oliver, BC. All right, time now to rewind the clock with the help of our CBC archives. A controversial national security bill introduced in Hong Kong. Massive street protests in a region already reeling from coronavirus. They may sound like this year's headlines, but this also happened in 2003. So here's that story from our reporter, Rosa Marcatelli. <laughs> Canada was supposed to be a temporary home for Jason Chan. <laughs> As a student from Hong Kong, he planned to stay for just a few years. That was 1988. When I saw the tank running over, right, in the Tiananmen Square, then I made up my mind and said, I, I cannot go back. His decision was reinforced in 97, when Britain handed Hong Kong back to China. Under Chinese rule, Chan never imagined he'd see this. A massive protest on the sixth anniversary of that changeover. Half a million people demonstrated in a country where there are rarely protests. Against legislation that would give sweeping powers to police and give the government more control over media and business. The protests are a combination of fear that Hong Kong is becoming a little much, too much like China in, in terms of government relationship with the people. But maybe more surprising than the protest, the government's reaction to it. First, the resignation of a key political ally. Then, bowing to pressure, Hong Kong's leader put the bill on hold, a bill his government has been pushing since last year. And this is really in response, further response, to the views and concerns expressed by the people. This has come as a big shock. It's, this is his own supporters have said, think again, not just the people in the street. Jason Chan calls it a temporary but welcome victory. His two brothers and their families still live in Hong Kong. Oh, wow, this is fantastic. And, and you demonstrate the power of the people. Hong Kong has already been beaten down by a tumbling economy and the government's slow initial response to SARS. The most recent crisis is doing little to help the beleaguered leadership of Tung Chi Hua win the confidence of its people. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Vancouver. CBC Vancouver is so lucky to have an award-winning photographer on staff. Ben Nelms captures all sorts of stories, big and small, in our city. Here are some of his best images of the week. And that's all for our Vancouver for this week. I hope you can join me weekday afternoons on CBC Radio 1 for On the Coast. Goodbye for now.